Welcome. Okay. I'm here with my dear friend Yuri, here at the handstand and awesome beard fame. In fact, I shaved my own beard off when I finally saw Yuri's in real life. I realised it wouldn't matter what I did, it wouldn't matter what fertiliser I put in there, <laughs> anything. It was never going to be like this. So I thought, well, okay. Anyway, we are here because we've had requests to do a little talk about injuries, the same as I did with Emmett recently, and that was very well received, and I know you have a different perspective to Emmett, um, and I've had some more thoughts on injuries since then. So perhaps you could speak generally first and then specifically about your own experience with injuries. Most of them, and I'll be honest, most of my injuries I think have been, just come from stupid decisions. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes, you know, there's that unpredictable element where there's nothing you can do to prevent it. Sometimes you can think about how could I have prevented this, given the knowledge that I've had with the injury. Um, but I, I feel that for myself, a lot of the time, it, most of my injuries could have been prevented if I just made better decisions on the spot. However, is, uh, just, for the our, experience. just for our, the part of our audience who doesn't yeah. know Yuri's work, he comes from a tricking and breakdancing background, and it's simply impossible to control. I don't know if I would call myself coming from a breakdancing background, because <laughs> I've dabbled. You've dabbled. Well, that's, that's very yeah. modest of you. All right, would it be better to say a tricking background then? I don't uh, well, I don't feel that I've really done any background to any sort of extent. But yeah, tricking was kind of where I started, like backyard martial arts, and then from there... And Trump and some of them yeah. um, So the, the point of mentioning those things is that unlike our work um, and many other conventional activities, the big difference between those activities is that once you leave the ground, um, you're at the mercy of gravity, and if your timing is not perfect, you won't land properly, and so I'm sure that some of your injuries would have come from those kinds of things. Not to mention yeah. jumping or something that was too There's high. There's that. A lot of it is reflexes that need to be built, and that's something that I've kind of gone back and, uh, and looked into, of how to teach that to adults, right. of how to build those reflexes so that when, not if, but when you do fall, you know how to dissipate that impact. Right. But as I said, a lot of it is... Sometimes it's just bad decisions, like maybe not warming up enough, or maybe it's the last, you know, last five minutes of the session, they're kicking out of the gym, I say, no, I want to throw one more. I've seen a lot of injuries happen there. Sure. Uh, so, it's, I mean, it's not the physical side of the injury, but it's the same idea with martial arts, the idea of preventing the fight is actually more powerful than, than getting into a fight and having to defend yourself. So yeah. I know that's something, especially with my current injury, it was literally just my own stupidity, and it's not the first time, and it probably won't be the last again either. No. But it's important, I guess, aspect of that to think about is the, the healing factor, the prevention, the psychology, but also not the physical prevention, but how could I have not gotten into that situation? Okay. In the first well, look, let me, let me share some things from my own experience. Uh, my own background athletically is quite different to yours. I was a middle distance runner for a long time and at a different stage in my life, an Olympic lifter. Uh, I never hurt myself doing Olympic lifting, by the way, but middle distance running, I hurt myself many times, and I think now, predominantly, I'm overtraining, basically not listening to my body. Yeah. For example, when I used to get out of bed first thing in the morning, um, my Achilles tendons were so tender, I'd have to walk in a kind of a flat-footed way for at least the first couple of minutes until some movement would come into them. Mm -hmm. And everyone else that I was training with and racing against in those days said exactly the same thing. They had the same problems. And you might recall I mentioned the other day that in the winter season in our, our annual cycle, I was running 100 miles a week and sometimes a tiny bit more, but not much more. That's an incredible load, so 160 k's a week um, and all at reasonable times, at reasonable speeds, I should say, as well. Okay, so overuse injuries, and this is the, the, the reason I mention it, overuse injuries... Um, injuries in particular that come from multiple repetitions right. of small range of movements need a completely different kind of care to Absolutely. the kind of injuries you're talking and about. It's interesting, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Most of my injuries have been the opposite of that. It's not yeah. overuse, but... It's in trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, so Which if is, you start then, yeah. you, you describe how you, how you look after traumatic injuries. So I guess the first step is the initial shock uh, because sometimes it takes a few minutes for it to set in. Sure. And I know some of the injuries that I've had, it's almost like I didn't want to believe that I was hurt. <laughs> so for example, I tore, I want to say it was the right leg, tore the LCL. And it was very obvious because I landed on one leg, still twisting. I felt a pop. I felt the knee go out of the socket. And I thought, oh, what, how do I feel? No, I feel okay. I'm going to do some squats. I'm going to do some jumps. Look, I can still do it. And it actually took a few hours for the knee to swell up and to lock up. And 
you know, like and, two and minutes. the mind doesn't want yeah, to accept absolutely. that an injury has happened. I can't, yeah. God, I know that. So yeah. I know two minutes after the injury, I thought I was like, no, I'm okay. I'm convincing myself I'm okay. And then four hours later, I was limping you know, <laughs> to my car. <laughs> so there's that part of it. Um, I guess for me also, because I'm, I'm generally, I'm pretty analytical, so I try to, to think and look back on, on how it happened and what happened. Mm. And like I said, this particular, so that was probably my worst knee injury, and I've had quite a few, but that one was really, like, it took me out for a couple months. It took me a few weeks to be able to squat again. It was just a bad decision. So leaving aside the causation of the yeah. problem, how did you actually deal with it? What did you do on a day-to-day -day basis? So this was a few years ago, and had I done it now, it would have been a little bit different. This was eight years ago, maybe more than that. Mm -hmm. So, for me, I mean, I never really ice like that. Never really worked for me. Same so, here, by the yeah. way. Yeah. So I, I guess number one would be get back to its basic, you know, properties. So be able to walk again would be the first thing. Being able to walk without limping. Mm -hmm. So basic range of motion, anything that involves basic blood flow. If it's swollen, I'll, I'll use a bit of compression mm -hmm. as well to compress it, and then just you know let the juices flow. So that's kind of, yeah, basic would be blood flow, movement, compression. Uh, the first, as it's rebuilding, not stressing it too much, but then after it has that basic yes. rebuild. But it still has to have some stretching. Yeah. This is the, the real art, <coughs> in my opinion at least anyway, is to be able to feel the difference between when something's healing, stretching yeah. enough and, and too much and not enough. Well, yeah, it's well, one that just takes awareness is knowing that right moment mm. of exactly how much force to put. Same thing with... Um, not waiting too long to get it back into the activity that injured oh, yes. it, but also being very careful about not crossing that line. Many, so kind sorry of, to interrupt, but yeah, one point. Many practitioners, I think they're playing cover, cover your ass more than anything else because yeah. they're, it's so common to hear, even in the modern era, it's so common to hear the prescriptions being given, oh, don't do anything and it will fix itself. That well, just it recovers to not, to be able to not do anything. That is simply not true. Yeah. Um, and the latest research in, into fascia, um, partly conducted by my friend Robert Schleip, is very clear on this, fascia as a, and fascia is the stuff that we hurt when we pull something, whether we're talking about a ligament or a tendon or a muscle, it's the fascia that experiences the damage and it's the fascia that has to be rebuilt. Now when the healing substances, the healing chemicals come into the site of the injury, the collagen and elastin and reticulin, they form it's, it's described in, in the literature as undifferentiated scar tissue, meaning that all the fibres are like, a bit like fibreglass. It's not the same because they're a rougher, more, they're not a smooth shape thing. They, all these long molecules come into this area. Just imagine a volume, something like this, that's where the injuries occurred. Plasma carrying these molecules comes into this area here, and all of the fibres are arranged at random. When you first hurt yourself, that, that's what it is. And until you actually do pulling work in particular, but also strengthening work later, until you load that tissue up so that this volume of tissue inside the larger muscle actually gets to experience the same forces, those fibres stay undifferentiated, but the actual physical pulling shows, and, the, and, mi and microscope photographs have shown this very clearly, that if you do work that structure, then what happens is the fibres, which might look um, extemporizing, you look something like this, they eventually get pulled in line and then literally absorbed into the tissue and after a period of time if the, if the history of the injury says that this thing is now fixed, that tissue is, looks exactly the same as the other tissue. But if you don't do that work, the fascia is constantly renewing itself and Robert says the fascia has a half-life of about I think six months from memory, which means that the majority of us turned over completely in the body in a two-year period. If in that period of time you're not doing that work and you're just letting that tissue rest, the undifferentiated tissue gets reproduced by the incoming new molecules and nothing changes. Absolutely. And we have both seen plenty of people who hurt themselves and they will say to you when you meet them, oh, look, I can't do this or I can't do that because of X, Y, or Z. As though the thing that they're living in is fixed in time, static. This is this thing, this marvelous thing that we live in. It's the ultimate adaptation machine. I know. Yeah, for me, I mean, I can get a bit obsessive in general. So if it was injury recovery, then it would be not just you know I do a couple sets a day, but all day, every day, always thinking about it, waking up, doing rotations, doing whatever movement. And I guess another couple notes for myself is that when the injury feels better, to not stop the rehab, mm. to continue probably for a couple more months. Just because that's still part of that 
that fine remapping process? I, I'd, add, I'd add, I'd look, that's, an, that's the dimension okay. that's so critical. The remapping that Yuri just mentioned then, you can have a perfect repair of a structure and a broken leg is a classic one where, where if, you re, if you x-ray the broken bone, um, let's say two to six months later, it will look completely fixed. In fact, it may have even overcompensated to be stronger than it was originally, but the owner of the leg is still limping around. And the reason is because the somatosensory cortex, that area in the brain that receives all the information from the proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors, still treats that part as injured. And so more than just continuing the rehab for a few months, my view on this is the part that got hurt has to be stressed more Absolutely. than the original injury. Now that sounds a bit frightening to say it because sometimes you can't, it's not you an easy to thing to duplicate. You have to know. You have to, be, you have to know. And in my own experience with injuries, and I've had many of them, as you know, it is not until, well, for example, for Achilles tendon injuries, it was actually learning how to bounce, learning how to jump on the spot. Right. And I remember the last time I had a pull on a calf muscle and a, and, and a tendon, Achilles tendon soreness, it wasn't until I was able to do a thousand jumps continuously, so not no rest in between, just just a little boom, 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 like that, that I one day I realised oh, it's, like, it's better now. There's no sense of... There's no sense when I do something that I have to take extra care because it's going to hurt, get hurt, or, or that there is in, in any way any particular sensitivity right. there. Is that what you would regard as oh, fixed? Yeah, and knowing that you can go past whatever point it is. Go past, yes. And so basically, if you think about that from the bigger picture perspective, what we're really talking about is a prescription for, at least to some extent, continually, slowly increasing the strength in our bodies, not just keeping it the same. Absolutely. That's I mean, time, I figure if time keeps going forward, it's actually de 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 degradation. Yes. So well, I mean, when you're my age, service. And, and I mentioned it, from the age of about 30 or 35, I can't remember the exact stats here, I think we're losing 1% muscle mass per year if you don't do anything. Right. So what that means, of course, 1% doesn't sound like much, right? But well, it might be 1% or 2%, but the thing, the thing is that means in 25 years you've lost yeah. a huge fraction of your strength. And most people don't do strength training. Most people over the age of 40, unless they're in our kind of environment, just don't do those things. I know another thought I had that I've gone through as well some injuries is the mm. compensation pattern you build oh. and then how to remap that. Very so good. you hurt your ankle, so you learn to stay off of the ankle as it's healing. But then if that takes a couple months, then you've built a new movement pattern that now might compromise something else. And I had one moment where one small injury led to a compensation pattern that led to two bigger ones. Oh, absolutely. So it's also something to... Absolutely. Well, here's a classic example from my mind. work that, that supports that perspective and that it's a theoretical and practical perspective. Someone who's hurt their back, for example, let's say they, and they might have a couple of contributing causes that might be a leg length difference or it might be one tight hip flexor or it might be a use pattern. They hurt their back, they have to change their movements in order to be comfortable in normal, normal daily life. And the next thing you know, you look at their feet and this person developed a pronating ankle on one side. They didn't have a pronating ankle up until that point. Then the back problem fixes itself. And the pronating ankle, I should elaborate on that a little bit, your body will pronate its ankle or an ankle on one side merely to keep that hip a little bit lower than the other foot or other hip on the other side. And so what happens is once the back injury is over, and let's say that takes four weeks or something like that, it's about average, two to, two to four weeks, then the next thing you know, you've got the propensity for another injury because your ankle's exactly. rolling in. It, it, you, I mean, really, really, the bottom line here is that you really have to pay attention to what your body is doing in order to adapt to the thing that you did that you call an injury because all of the downstream effects that we're talking about, they themselves can become problems in time, right? Yeah, and it just takes another high level of awareness. Like I know one specific example is I had a rib injury. So for a, a couple of weeks it hurt to do any kind of pulling down mm -hmm. of my shoulders, but I still did pulling movements. So what happened was I compensated by not being able to engage the lap properly, and then I tore the teres tricep connection. Right. So it was just, yeah, it was interesting, again, you know, looking back on that later, how it happened. So it was a compensation pattern that stressed something else and then accumulation. Look, I was listening to a recording that I made in a monastery in, in Asia. This might not sound as though it's connected, but it utterly and absolutely is connected. And I won't go into the details of, of what we were doing on that particular retreat, but the key lesson that I was trying to convey to the students I was working with is 
how do you feel what's going on inside your own body? Because it's all very well to say you need a high level of awareness yeah. and, and you need to pay attention to what's going on in your own body. But if you do not have a personal habit of actually feeling what's happening in your own body, a practitioner like yourself and myself can say, look, you just need to pay attention to what's going on in your own body. And the person's hearing this thinks, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah, pay attention to what's happening that. in your own body. Yeah. Because the majority of people that we work with, or at least with I work with, they're not, at least in my, this, this could be pejorative to say this, but my experience of most people is that they're not interacting with the raw primal sensations from the body, they're interacting with their idea of what their body is, mm -hmm. or the posture or the alignment or, in your world, what this particular position looks like right, from the outside. And as a performer, of course, you have to do that. But at the same time, if you want to be injury free and if you, if you want to move yourself from one particular state of awareness to another state of awareness, you absolutely have to pay intimate attention to all the sensations of the body. And there's, there's, one, there's a couple of other things on this as well that are critical. The sensations of the body, are, they exist only in each instant of time as they happen. So you feel something, the next instant you go to try to feel that same thing again, and these already change, right? They suddenly feel the same. Unless the pain is constant and unrelenting, which is definitely not a good sign. But when you're working with the body, especially when the body is in pain, there is a very strong impulse to actually withdraw your awareness from that part of the body because it's actually hurting you. And this system that we live in operates That's with really insanity. interesting because I've always done the opposite. But if I had intense pain, I would focus even more on it. Well, you would and I would. But we're not normal, I'm afraid. Right. And we know, we know that part of our approach to rehabilitation, when we come, here's an example, we'll come across someone who will tell you, I've had back pain for 10 years. And in my clinic situation, that is something that used to happen every week. Mm -hmm. And so the person that has had a problem of that kind for a long period of time, and because their back pain is experienced as pain, they've got a very strong vested interest in not being connected to that part of the body. So step one is to actually remake that connection. So how do you remake that connection so the person can feel that part of the body at the same time as their body is telling them that it, it doesn't, that they don't want to feel that part of the body? And so that's why we have some very gentle initial movements which basically show people how to take that part of the body through the desired range of movement and where the experience will not be painful. Now I know that's quite different to your work and, and, and my work as an adult in all the different things that I've been doing is also quite different to that too. But so I, I, the reason I'm mentioning this is that's one end of the spectrum. The person who has invested energy, unconsciously usually, in distancing themselves from the problem part all the way through to your end of the spectrum where if something hurts or doesn't feel right, you're liable, you will in fact put far more energy into that part than you otherwise would. I would, but in, in my world, it's oftentimes the opposite. It's you know, like, like performers, dancers, whatever, they're so used to having, you know, they perform at such a high level, they always have some kind of aches and pains. So a big part of that, that world is also pushing through it because you always have it. But at the same time, it, in terms of longevity, it's probably... Pushing through yeah. it, but hopefully not damaging it further. So pushing through it. I mean, we have hopefully, both of us... Hopefully, but you know, injury rates are fairly high in the, the world of professional... Acrobatics well, we have all performed. Well. I've been yeah. teaching, you've been performing when we've been in pain, right? Absolutely. And we more or less look as though we're not actually experiencing Oh, that's pain. part of the performance. It's part of the performance. <laughs> I agree completely. However, as you said, and this is a very important point, it may not be the best formula for longevity. So, so for example, my wrist is a little bit injured now, but I can do some stuff on it. So mm -hmm. to do a weekend of handstand workshop, I have to do some demos. They're a little bit compromised from my perspective. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I'm sure, don't know this the difference, but it's a good kind of test for the end of the injury to see that I can handle it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if I didn't have those few days off in between, I know that it would stress the injury too much. Interesting, you so should mention that. how much to put in. That's interesting. I just something that's occurred to me. The we may be not as different as we think we are. I realized well when I was demonstrating a Y pose on a. a stretch therapy for performance workshop on the weekend. I took the leg out to the front um, with the support mm -hmm. leg completely straight. That was fine. And then when I took it out to the side, I fell off my balance point. That happened on both legs. And so ever since then, which is what, three days ago now, I realize I've been concentrating on balance more and more. So when I was putting on my clothes this morning, I made sure that I was absolutely rock solid on each leg. So I guess we're both fanatics. That's probably the truth of it. 
Um, but if I guess the, the choice really comes down to this: how how actually do you want to live? Do you want to be controlled by your injuries? And we, I mean, I'm sure you know people that yeah. are controlled. They actually define themselves by their. I think injuries. it depends on the sacrifices that you want to make yeah. as well. Like for for what I do for performance, there's a very big difference of getting to the highest possible level of performance, mm -hmm. or being able to do enough that you can do it for a long time. But in this case, you have to sacrifice the level. So it's. If you want to do it for 80 years, you probably have to be very basic for the most part. If you want to get to the highest possible level for today's standards, there's a good chance you'll get broken by the time you're 30 with the tricks that a lot of people are doing today. So it's kind of, yes. there's a difference between that. I know the people that I know that have performed for a long time, like well into their 50s, mm -hmm. they don't do hard tricks, but they know how to present them. And that's a much more sustainable model for longevity compared to, I need the respect, because most people don't even know the difficulty of the tricks that look at them. So that's part of the performance world as well, is to present something and make it look a certain way. And that's kind of regardless of whether it's a high level trick or not. That's a really interesting point, and I realize the internet has played a massive role yeah. in this. My experience of watching things is the level of the difficulties of things being done seems to have increased significantly in the last... Exponentially, almost. I, I would say exponentially, and, and it's all happened really in the last... It's because five. we know it's possible. Five to ten years, here. you see someone doing it, you think, all oh, right, okay, I'll have a go at that. Now, in my own case, I'm old now, um, and I've had to back off doing some of the things that I do. For example, I mentioned yesterday, I think it was, that um, the only weight training I'm doing at the moment is sumo squats yeah. and uh, front squats. And the reason for that is both of those squats don't stress the very deepest part of my lower back. Still makes, allows me to be reasonably strong. But it's a modification that you can make. You have you to have modify the things. To make that. And if you don't modify things and you don't accept the relentless march of the changes which are getting old, then you're doomed to suffering. There's no doubt about it. And a lot of people don't. They get fixed into a routine and they do that routine and then this is why I'm so against kind of specified patterns and routines, but rather change them as you go. And if you can change them from day to day, from workout to workout, that's even better. I, I look, you know how I try yeah, and exactly the same way. Um, so look, I guess what we're, what we're both saying here is, uh, well, we're actually saying the same thing, and we've been saying the same thing since we started, you must tune in to what your body is telling you in each instant of every workout. And so for example, when I'm lifting, let's say I'm working around 100 kilos, 110 kilos in the sumo squat at the moment, it's a pathetic weight really, but it's what I'm capable of doing at the moment. Um, I bought the two, two and a half kilo plates because I found I couldn't actually make the jump to 110 from the earlier, from 100, it was just too much of a jump. And so I had to go to, I had specially bought two, two and a half plates, I've never used two and a half kilo plates in my life, I'd except when I was in the lifting, and that was only to, you know, to, to make a number of, at a comp. Um, and so I realised, no, I'm going to, this is just a, a stark reality check, yes, I'm going to have to deal in two and a half kilo jumps on each end of the bar from now on. It's no drama at all, but it's a, it is a very important thing to realise. Yeah. That's important, I think. Well, so how would you, what would you sum up your approach to injuries? And if you were, if you were just to give, let's say, three or five top prescriptions to yeah. someone who's injured themselves today or yesterday, what would you say to them That's to do? Interesting. So I guess the first would be to, to see the reaction initially of the body and of the mind and that within the first few hours and then for me within the first two, three days you can tell the severity of the amount of pain, the amount of swelling, the, the amount your body wants to back away from it. So 48, so, 48 yeah. to 72 hours. So that's kind of an indicator I guess of the, the long-term severity of what that injury is. Yeah. And I mean obviously I, I'm, I don't really trust medical practitioners but obviously there's a point at which it would benefit to get it checked out, but it, uh, there's both sides to that. Look, that's a, that's a good point. I have to say I don't trust medical practitioners either, and the reason is, uh, let me be specific about why that is. If you go to someone who's a surgeon, then don't be surprised if they recommend yeah, they surgery. They want to sell you on a surgery. You, they will recommend surgery because, it's, and it, no, there's no malice here, it, that's their speciality, that's their expertise, and it's, it's just as much the fault of the patient as it is of the practitioner. Um, if you go to have MRIs, X-rays, CAT scans, whatever done, um, and you feed that, that information to a surgeon, in most cases after an injury there'll be something that can be restored yeah. surgically. I mean I was reading that if they scan pretty much any adult shoulder or hip or whatever they could find something 
to say that, oh, this needs to be surgically repaired there's in a very famous, high percentage of cases. There's a very famous study in the New England Journal of Medicine that, that showed, showed the same x-ray to 12 different famous um, radiographers, radi radi whatever, it's a radiologist. radiographer, radiologist. I can't remember which is the which is the correct term. But anyway, the doctors who yeah. specialise in reading those things, and they've got twelve different perspectives on the same okay. thing. So that's interesting. Now that's uh, not to be critical of Western medicine. If I tore my ACL or LCL, I'd be having it won't a, heal by itself. If I tore it, it off, there, right. you'd have to have it surgically reattached. There's no way that any standard rehab will do that. And so basically. It's a question of assessing in that first 72 hour period, yeah. is this something, in fact you can't have anything done. But that's one of those two, like ACL tears usually, it's very obvious within the first few hours it is. with the swelling and with the knee instability. However, yeah. we, we also know people who've had grade one or two tears that have repaired them perfectly. So, so no surgery. And so it, it depends on the extent of the tear. If the tear is complete, then like our friend Craig um, who had a, an ACL reconstruction done, it was it was brilliantly done, it took a long time, they did use a technique that took almost two years of rehab to um, complete, but he's able to do I think six or eight or maybe ten now single leg squats on each leg and his knee feels bulletproof, yeah, better than before it. in fact. So yeah, so I guess yeah, um, understanding the severity, number two would be, um, again it also of course depends on the severity, but general movement, heat, anything to promote more blood flow. Blood flow is healing, it has nutrients, it gets out the junk, so that's regardless not, of what the injury is. Not just blood flow. I was going to comment on this before. When you were talking about using compression around yep. the injured part, that's a lymphatic system yeah, thing that you're doing. So we have these two things. Plasma and other substances come into the site of the injury via the bloodstream, but the byproducts get taken away by the lymphatic yeah. system largely. Not completely, but largely. And so compression, light massage, and movement are the main things that Absolutely. make the lymphatic yeah, system heat. respond. And so heat doesn't do for yeah, all of those things. So light compression, that's, that's not something that's generally recommended for injuries. I support that completely myself. And in my case, I don't recommend ice. Personally, my body hates the sensation of things cold on an injured part. Right. I mean, it just says it's wrong. Um, and it cuts off the blood flow, it right? It cuts off the blood flow, which, which we stops the inflammation. But we want the inflammation to proceed. That's part of the process. It, it's the absolutely process. fundamental part of the process. That's where it all starts to happen. We want that to proceed, but we want the lymphatic drainage to take right. the byproducts away. And that's where light compression and movement are critical. Because so. I have hurt myself, and I've hurt myself many times, as you know. Absolutely, even if I have to hobble around, and I've had to do that, um, I, I will do that, definitely. Yeah, and rest as well, of course. You will be forced to rest anyway yeah. if you've got an injury. But you must rest. It must be, uh, let me put it in formal terms, it must be active rest. Absolutely. Okay, so that's two. And three? Three would be to gradually start to put stress on the injury. Now, at what point, and let's not try to put too many strict numbers on this, but I agree with you completely right. with that. At some point, the body will tell yeah. you, okay, and you know what's enough. So for example, uh, when I hurt my knee, one stress might be a half squat, like a few days into it. A squat to 90 degrees, leaning a little bit towards my good side, that might be stressing the injury at that point in the De injury. Definitely, definitely. So you have to assess, uh, like we said, you have to assess in the moment what it can handle. You want to feel that discomfort because that's part of the process, but yeah. you also have to know what line not to cross and being very careful not to go and there. No sets and reps approach can tell you that. Absolutely. Uh, no load, loading protocol can tell you that. You have to carefully, while being in complete control of the movement, explore the movement, feel what's happening in the body and be prepared to back out of it gracefully and yeah, slowly absolutely. when you feel that you've gone far enough. That's an exercise in itself, just developing the capacity to make that judgment. But it's if you can't make that judgment, then Usually it takes a few worse injuries to know how to make that judgment. <laughs> that, that is true. <laughs> that is true. Well, like I, I, know I, had a, I had a groin injury that I, over a period of six months, I heard it a few times over because certain movements I just did and I should have avoided. Mm. And it, later on, towards the last couple months, I was a lot more conscious of the rehab and that helped. But I know there was that period of six months where, yeah, uh, same thing. I had you know, golfers up over a few years on and off because they were just moments that I felt it and I pushed through the workout anyway and it just stressed it again. A question of clarification, is golfer's elbow on the inside or the, the outside? Inside, so, so here, from what I understand, so yeah, tennis elbow is tennis here. Tennis elbow is on the outside, that's right, so one's from this yeah. and the other's from pulling, mostly. Yeah. 
massive forearm. Yeah, you're showing off now. <laughs> right handed. <laughs> okay, what else would I say? Uh -huh. And then I guess the fourth would be. Oh, the fourth is. Yeah. Getting back to whatever injured you. Or loading it, yeah. loading it properly. Yeah. So we, we could. We and could that might take time, it might take months, it might take longer, but I think that, of course that also depends on the severity. It does. Um, I had an Hampton injury that we've been communicating about for the last, it seems like, years, but it's not. It, it, it's over now. It was in my right leg, which up until the injury was my looser leg in formal Hampton stretching. I don't even remember what I did that hurt it. I can't recall. Um, but every forward bend after that point was extremely painful, right up in, right up in this, this high attachment yeah. underneath the glute here. Probably most likely the uh, the attachment of the outer hamstring to the ischial tuberosity, I would say, and if not that, it was long head of um, biceps, no, short head of biceps femoris. Anyway, wherever it was, and I'm, everyone has had in hamstring injuries at some point or other, and in some place or other, sometimes they dislocate down to the knee. But anyway, the point is this. It wasn't until I started doing um, single leg Romanian deadlifts, which require a massive amount of stabilisation, and we've got links to these things on our website, single leg Romanian deadlifts and relatively heavy Bulgarian deadlifts, which are bent leg deadlifts, and I got up in the last cycle to just over 100 kilos in, in those for sets of five. It wasn't until I really felt that part of the body was strong, and this took a long period of time. I mentioned that it took, it was almost two years, I was doing, with Olivia, we were doing a, um, a stretch therapy performance workshop at False Grip in, mm -hmm. in Sydney, fabulous location. Uh, and I did the same because we were preparing to do, I think we were doing the pancake sequence, so it was the afternoon sequence, and I took the leg out to the front, which normally is just absolute agony. And there was, this, this is the thing that is just so shocking. There was no transition from the day or two days before when I stretched that hamstring and it was sore to all of a sudden straighten the leg, boom, nothing. And then took it out to the side, nothing. And so that's something that a lot of people that haven't had a lot of injuries don't realise. Sometimes the transition from experience of this part as injured to it's completely fixed can be like that. Yeah. At other times it's slow and gradual and can even go backwards and come forward, backwards and come forward like your groin injury did. Yeah. It's normal. And so and so I guess the key lesson here is don't expect anything. Just see what's actually happening in the part and under no circumstances stop Absolutely. using it. And sometimes it can take years and I think a lot of people yes. want that want to know that time frame and you don't know. Well, that's a really good point because I found myself getting quite frustrated with this, this yeah. hamstring and I'm sure you've got frustrated Absolutely. in the past yourself. Um, as soon as you feel yourself getting frustrated, you really have to let your tummy relax and do whatever you need to do to let that frustration go because that's having the opposite effect on it. There has to be grace and ease in that part and frustration is the opposite end of that spectrum. Now, it might sound a bit sort of Pollyanna-ish to say you have to learn to just accept what is happening to you, but the fact is if you don't learn that lesson, you're doomed to re-injuring yourself, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I know from a perspective, because I did coach gymnastics for a while, and you'll see a lot of, um, so just one example, I guess it kind of goes against pretty much everything that we've been doing, but it's a good example of that. So one girl in particular would, um, she sprained her ankle doing some kind of tumbling pass, mm -hmm. so the rehab was, you know, okay, tape it up, but you don't put any weight on that ankle for a few weeks, do conditioning, whatever, set-ups, push-ups, handstands. Mm -hmm. And then in the, those three weeks, she comes back, she tumbles on it. Of course, she hurts it again because there was never... Never the stress. Yeah, never enough stress in the first place. And the, she did a little bit of ankle rehab, but it was, you know, like a two-pound TheraBand, which is pretty much useless for an ankle that needs let, to let take both multiples let of body it, weight. Let it both be specific here. If the task that you have to do is tumbling, and let's yeah. say we're landing two times, two and a half times, three times yeah. body weight, let's say, then your rehab is not complete until in a controlled situation yeah. you've loaded that part up with the same expected. Exactly. Although you can't duplicate the speed of that force and, uh, except by tumbling, but you can definitely du duplicate the actual force. Oh, for force. Sure. And then I guess the other thought would be the, the movement pattern. So did she injure it because of a freak accident or does she land in a certain way? Maybe one foot tends to, what's the word, supinate, supinate too much. Yes, yes. And maybe through some kind of movement pattern is why she re-injured it because she never fixed that pattern that got her hurt in the first place. Yes. And it's something to look at, but it's something, of course, you know, in this gym they didn't. So it was, and I would see that happen oftentimes where someone would repeat the same injury and then that ankle is probably going to be hurt for the rest of their lives. 
because they've heard it a couple of times and now they have that mental block of a... Let me explore that mental block a moment because this is something I've played with for a huge amount of my meditation work. The mental block is when you get down into it, when you drill into it and really look at it, it's actually anxiety about can I trust this part? Absolutely. That's what we mean by mental block, just to be specific. Yeah. And so this is why what Yuri said before about needing to re-experience the force that you can expect in your normal um, performing or whatever it is that you're doing is absolutely critical. In fact, I'd go further and say you need to consciously experience more force than what it was that caused the injury before the brain suddenly switches over and says, oh, okay, I can trust that part. And by trusting that part, the anxiety, and the reason anxiety is such an important thing to consider is that when you become more anxious, the tension in your whole body goes up and in, and in that part even more in anticipation of hurting it. So until you've actually experienced that loading where the body's in fact completely relaxed about that loading, the part has not cured, it's not fixed. Another thought, like again in this example, but of course it can be adjusted, they would also taper ankle for a while. So out of that rehab, they would, you know, like a boxer, tape the ankle yes. so it remains stiff, yes. which is also, in that case, not good for the rehab because no. the ankle doesn't do its own stabilization yes. when it yes, has absolutely. that artificial force. So I know that's something I get asked a lot as well is, uh, is about braces and all of that. And as much as possible, it's better if your body can do its own stabilization. It will, and if it gets used to an external aid, then it will get lazy to rely on that because it knows that it doesn't have to stabilize on its own. Well, definitely, and look, there's a long thread to be explored there, we'll do it another time, but basically taping works through stimulation and lack of stimulation of the superficial fascial layer, and, and in fact, fine tuning of all coordination, and fine motor tuning occurs in the superficial fascial layer, so if you do use taping, and I do know it's, it's got its pluses, its, its advantages, you need to lose the taping as soon as possible, okay. so that your own superficial fascial layer performs that role that it's designed to do. Couldn't agree more. And in yeah, fact, I don't use a lifting belt in my lifting at all. It's interesting ever. looking back on it now, how they, they basically set this poor girl up for repeating that injury. Mm, you are. Yeah. You are. All right, well, I think, that's, I yeah, think that's that will give people to, uh, something to think about, and uh, we'll put this up on both of our channels. And thanks very much, man. Yeah, thank you. Look forward to the next visit. Okay. Yeah, always.